And when you get to chapter 12, hmm? or to chapter 13. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 13. Say, so find the text. Find the text. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test. Come on. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, of course, you fail? You can be seated. We have looked over the past few weeks about salvation and how it impacts us. Uh, we've looked at uh, the meaning of salvation. We've looked at the source of salvation. Next week we're going to look at the security of salvation. But the meaning of salvation is to be saved from an impending Danger. We talked about the fact that all of us were bound for hell. You reconcile yourself to the fact that until the day we receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our lives, we were, we had an appointment with hell. The source of our salvation, though, was one day Jesus Christ came into our hearts. People often say, well, I finally found the Lord. No, I corrected that last week. You didn't find the Lord. He was not the one lost. Right. Amen. 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 He found us. Right. And we received, listen to me now, salvation. We didn't just join the church. We didn't just have an experience. Come on now. We didn't just get baptized. We received. Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives. And that's the only way that we could ever have a relationship with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except he come by me. There's no other way to get to God except through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says again, if thou shalt confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is no joke. There's only two things that exist in the realm of the spiritual. Either you are saved or you're lost. Either you're on God's side or you're on the devil's side. Simple as that. Either you are going to eventually end up in hell where the fire burns forever and, the, and, and, and it's the worst experience that you ever had. And, and, and you know what? Folks ought to quit saying that. I'm glad we're still on the radio. Folks ought to quit saying that. I might as well go to hell. All my friends are going to be there. Listen, <laughs> you and your friends are not going to recognize each other in hell. Right. It's going to be eternal torment. Ain't gonna be no party. Right. It will be eternal torment. The worst torment you could ever imagine in your life. Now, I've had some pretty significant pain in my life. I've had experiences that, quote unquote, the doctor said, this is not my impression, this is what the doctor said, would rival having a baby. Now, I'm gonna take his word for that, I'm not looking to try that. Yeah, you know, plus I'm past that age anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I have my tubes tied. So. <laughs> 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 say help my <laughs> It is the worst pain 
that you could possibly imagine. I spent a year in the Republic of Vietnam fighting for the military of the United States of America. And I was in firefights with bullets whizzing around me, mortars and, 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 and rockets. But you know what really scared me over there? When, when, when you're getting shot at and when bombs are around you, you just, you just react. What scared me was during the monsoon season when it's complete darkness in the sky and there's no moon. And the darkness is so dark, you can feel it. And you know something is out there. Come on, somebody. It's an eerie, I mean, that, yeah, that was the, the thing that scared me more than anything else, is that pitch black darkness and not knowing what's out there. Hell is like that every minute of every day you're there. Except you're in pain every second of every minute that you're there. Think about what it sounds like when you see somebody, when you hear somebody scratch their fingernail down the blackboard. The worst experience you could ever experience in life, forever. That's what you're headed to without Jesus. But once you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior in your life, you're bound for Mount Zion. Those the old folks just say, I'm bound for Mount Zion. Way up on the hill. If anybody makes it, surely I will. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, John chapter 14. Believe in me. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm just going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. How many of you know God has already hooked it up? Now, you might live in a shack down there, but there's a mansion waiting for you in heaven. You might not have two nickels to rub together down here, but you'll walk street paved with gold. You'll have, you'll be able to see the city of God that, that's got the 12 gates with the diamonds and the jasper and all the jewels. You will be somebody in God. You have an appointment there if you receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. So the meaning of salvation, the source of salvation is Jesus, and then the uh, uh, the security of salvation. We're going to talk about that last week. But Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, test yourselves. We talk about this salvation experience, but he says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, if there's a test that determines whether I'm saved or not, I certainly want to take it. And why do I need to say that? Because oftentimes people have a head experience with Christ, but it's not a heart experience. What do you mean? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Oftentimes people will come up because they've been moved by the service or Pastor gives the invitation, they have an emotional response, and they come up, and they, they say the words, but their heart doesn't set anchor in the salvation experience. All right, all right. So, so, so they felt good for a while, but as soon as they go back out in the world, and they get tested and tried by the enemy, their salvation doesn't hold because it wasn't a heart experience. Believe me, child of God, Unless you've had a hard experience, the devil will knock you off your salvation experience. He can't take away your salvation, but we'll go through the motions thinking we were saved, and we really did. So, we need to make sure that our behavior falls in line with what the Bible says about salvation. Now, the other thing I'll say is this. <coughs> There are people under the sound of my voice right now, and you know that experience that you had was real. You know that you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. But from time to time, you have those experiences. Amen. And you say, this doesn't line up with what the Word of God says my life should be like. And if you don't watch it, 
the devil will catch you on one of those, I'm going to say a bad day. Because I know John tells us that we don't practice sin anymore. Amen. So you can have a bad day, but it not become a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. But whosoever is born of God does not practice. John said in 1 John. Does not practice. Sin does not become their lifestyle. Please remember. Dogs bark. Roosters crow. Sin is sin. It's their nature. Don't tell a dog not to bark. That's his nature. He, he can't help but to bark. Don't tell a sinner not to sin. That's their nature. Why do we waste our breath telling a sinner, you need to quit sinning? They can't. You see. And you struggle with it. And I struggle with it. There's times our behavior does not line up with what the Word of God says in our life. So what, so what uh, uh, Paul says, he says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Now that word, test, it, it's an active kind of word. He doesn't mean, you know, it's Friday uh, in, in November, the third Sunday, take the test. He means keep testing yourselves to see whether you are in the faith or do you not recognize for yourself that Jesus Christ is in you Unless indeed you fail the test. So the implication is that you need to keep taking the test. Okay, so what is the test? Well, uh, Pastor Howard, here we go. We've gone through uh, all of these things. What is the test? Some help I just went Catholic, did <laughs> Number one, how do I know? I'm saying, here's the first question. Have you enjoyed spiritual fellowship with God and with Christ and with fellow believers? Now, you need to understand what I'm saying here because a lot of people say, God never talks to me. Then you, you know, I'm, you need to question your experience. If God never communicates with you, if you've never enjoyed, look at what it says now. Spiritual fellowship with God. That, that word fellowship is, is the Greek word koinonia. That's right. it's, that, it's not just a casual conversation with God. It's that entwined relationship where you talk to God and God talks to you and you and him. It's like Adam and God walking through the garden together. Oh, you remember before Adam got, before sin came in the garden? Adam and God used to walk through the gates of fellowship. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God brought to Adam all the animals and let Adam name the animals. That's right. Come on now. God, Adam was sitting down there fellowshipping with his boy God. And God said, Adam, what you going to call that? I think I'm going to call that a giraffe. What are you going to call that? I think I'm going to call that a horse. What are you going to call that? That's going to be a lion. Adam and God had that kind of fellowship together. And then sin came. Hear me when I say this. You cannot fellowship with God and sin be in the picture at the same time. It is impossible. The Bible says in the book of Habakkuk that God is of pure eyes than to behold iniquity and cannot look upon iniquity. When you've got sin in your life, God can't even look down at you. Amen. Have you enjoyed Spiritual fellowship with God and with Christ. Now, I need you to hear this. I'm nervous when people always talk about God and they never say anything about Christ. Because God has given everything unto Jesus. He's given him the name which is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're here to lift up the name of Jesus. We're here to magnify the name of Jesus. We're here to glorify the name of Jesus. We're here to participate in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You cannot have a relationship with God if you have not made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. So have you enjoyed fellowship with God and with Christ? 
and with fellow believers. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. <coughs> First John chapter 1. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say wait. Amen. First John chapter 1. Verse 3 and 4. And actually, let's start at verse 1. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Now John was writing 90 years uh, after the death of Jesus. Actually about 60 years after the death of Jesus. And he was reaffirming his, his apostolic authority in the fact that he had seen Jesus. He's saying, what I'm writing to you, I can testify of because I looked at it. I heard it. My hands have touched him. And we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're proclaiming this fellowship, what we've seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. You have never experienced fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ, I can assure you, you're not saved. Because when you are saved, you have fellowship with God. You have fellowship with Christ. How many of you have ever experienced that time where you're in fellowship with, 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 with the Lord and, and the Holy Spirit really begins to move? And no matter where you're at, you really can't control what's going on at the moment. And when it gets, gets so good that you just have to walk around holding yourself. Come on now. Amen, somebody. When it gets so good, your feet are going. And ain't no music playing anywhere but in your head. How do you know it gets so good sometimes in that fellowship with the Lord that you go to a language that you've never spoken before? Amen, Amen somebody. That you begin to feel things and hear things and understand things that you know are outside of yourself. That's fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, please don't say, I can have fellowship with God and fellowship with Christ and not have fellowship with, unbelief, with other believers. Okay. It doesn't work like this. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love God. Is that what he said? No, that's not what he said. <laughs> By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love Christ. No, he said the manifestation of showing the world. Everybody will know that you're a child of God. If you love one another. Now see, it's not hard loving God. It is not. I mean, let's just, let's just wait out for a minute. Heaven, hell. Blessings, curses. It's not hard to love God. It's not hard to love Christ. He died for our sins. He took the punishment of sins for you and I, died on a cross, experienced the most excruciating punishment that man could ever experience, rose from the dead for three days, it's not hard to love him. Come on now. Thank you. Okay, but everybody stand up for a minute. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> now, now look around the room. Just look around the room. Everybody look around the room. Okay, now sit down and everybody look at the wall. <laughs> 
Now you like that some people that were hard to love. I'm just being honest with you. You looked at some people that you have to work at to love. Now I'm not talking about folks out in the street yet either. Because it said, have you enjoyed that spiritual fellowship with God, with Christ, and with fellow believers? It bothers me that we're all a part of the body of Christ. Come on now. One church. One church. One, one. One church under Jesus Christ. And it's not faith Christian. It's not Metropolitan. It's not Shiloh. Not all those different congregations. There's one church. One church. Uh-oh. Yet people in a certain congregation can't get along with people in another congregation. There's something wrong with that. Amen. 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 If we are saved, we love fellow believers. Yes. <coughs> we don't care what congregation they belong to. We don't care what denomination they belong to. We don't care whether they speak in tongues or whether they don't speak in tongues. We don't care the formula by which they're baptized. And all we care about is have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. So the first thing is have you enjoyed spiritual fellowship with God and with fellow believers. How you doing so far? Okay. Do you love other believers? That's different than just having fellowship with them. We had fellowship after service last Sunday. We sat down, we ate, we fellowship. I think it's going to take work for us to be able to love some of the people who are sitting down with. Amen? So the second test is, do you love other believers? Now, as we go through this, give yourself a check mark and say, doing good. <laughs> and then when you get done, I'm going to say, needs work. <laughs> Amen? Because Paul says, keep testing yourself. And if there's errors in your life that need work, you might as well admit it. God knows it. And for the most part, everybody else around you knows it too. Amen. You're the only one that's denial. You're the only one that's getting fooled. If, if, if I told, listen, if we had one of those moments where we could just be brutally honest, and I said, okay, everybody stand up and point at the person in here that you know they don't love other believers, we pick you up. <laughs> Amen. If we said, pick out the person that gossips the most in the church, everybody would be able to get up and point that person out. If we said, pick out the person that lies all the time. <laughs> Amen. Do you love unbelief? If you need work, write down you need work. God knows you need work. Pastor knows you need work. Most of the people in your family know you need work. Most of the people in church know you need work. Number three, do you have a sensitivity uh -oh. to sin? Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Well, you were already there, weren't you? <laughs> Okay, you ready for this? Okay. Verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare unto you. John is saying this is the message that we heard from Jesus. And now we're declaring that unto you. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. You see that? If we claim we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. John says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in anything other than the light and say we have fellowship with him, we're lying. That's what he says. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, 
purifies us from sin. Watch verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, you're fooling your neighbor. John said, you ain't fooling nobody. If you claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Do you have a sensitivity to sin? Do you know when the things you've done are outside the line of God's word? Here's one of the things that we need to learn. Let me, let me, let me break down the sensitivity to sin in a way that you're going to understand it. Because the sensitivity to sin becomes more acute as you give more of yourself to the Holy Spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart, in your life, the minute of conversion. But he doesn't have all of you. Amen. People talk about how often the Holy Spirit begins to fill you. My position is that the Holy Spirit fills you with as much of him as he has at the moment of conversion. As you become knowledgeable of the word, you surrender more of yourself to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, it would be like, Lord, give me some more of the Holy Spirit to help me live right. And God would say, well, well where am I going to get him from? When Jesus saved you, you were filled with the whole, all the Holy Spirit I have to give you. Now, what you need to do is surrender more of yourself to him. Now, watch this. How do I know if I have a sensitivity to sin? If you have to say, Pastor Howard, do you think it's right for me to do this? The <laughs> people often ask it, well, do you think it's right to do this? Come on. You're trying to give me the cosign on your sin is what you're trying to do. If, if you have to ask, you know, if you have to ask that question, you were convicted in the first place. Something on the inside of you said, this is not the right thing to do. But what happened? The sensitivity to sin didn't say, shut up, don't do it. But go stand in front of Pastor Howard and look dumb. <laughs> Is it all right to play the lottery? Come on, don't ask me that. <laughs> Amen. Bible says bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. That there might be room, there might be meat in my house. And prove me now, here what saith the Lord, that I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough for you to spare, to receive. He didn't say nothing about the lottery. I just figured I'd throw that in. Now y'all might want to get mad at me. <laughs> Pastor Howard, do you think it's all right to live with my boyfriend until we get married? Come on. You're trying to give me the cosign on your sin again. No, it's not right because the Bible said that when you cohabitate together, it's after you take your vow. There's no way, there's no area. Don't get mad at me. I'm sorry. Just tell your Bible now. And if you're in that position, just get right. Don't get mad, get right. Amen. <laughs> A sensitivity to sin would say, Pastor, I recognize that I'm wrong. And I've had people come and tell me this. I recognize that the situation I'm living in is wrong. And here's what's going to happen. At so and so and such and such a time, we're going to get married and get this right in front of God. I've had people in this congregation that have come and told me that. And they're married and they're still together. But don't act like, you know, everything is all right because everything is not all right. That sensitivity to sin, the Holy Spirit will begin to convict you. If the Holy Spirit does not convict you of things that are wrong in the Word of God, then you do not have the sensitivity of sin as acute as it can be. Now, it might not necessarily mean that you're not saved, but it might mean you need to surrender more of yourself.
to the Holy Spirit. There are certain people, and hear me now, I, I want you to hear me. There are some people that will not drink a drop of anything that they consider to be alcohol. They won't drink wine. That's, amen. That's the way the Holy Spirit has convicted them. There are other people that say, well, a glass of wine is all right every now and then. Right? Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. The Holy Spirit has to bring the sensitivity of sin as it ministers to you. But here's what I would say. If I know you don't drink wine, and I want a glass of wine, and we're out somewhere together, I ought not order wine because I don't want to cause you to stumble. Amen? And see, we have so much drama in the church where we're pointing fingers at each other because of our behavior where... All we want to do is get along and love Jesus. Amen? Do you have a sensitivity to sin? Where is your sensitivity to sin? Either put a check mark or end up needs work. Number three. Do you practice sin less now that you have professed faith in Christ? Remember I said... Christians are not sinless. Christians sinless. John just said, please don't say that you are without sin. He said, please don't say that. As a matter of fact, he said, when you do sin, here's what you do. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at 1 John chapter 3. How are we doing so far? Uh -huh. <laughs> I know why it took so long to get to this. <laughs> there was some part I didn't want to come to yet. First John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Do you have it? Well, let's start at verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, understand, when he talks about keep on sinning, he is talking about those who practice sin, who have made sin a lifestyle. If you can be comfortable in sin, then you have to question whether you are saved or not. If you can just sin and sin and sin and just continue to live a rebellious life, even though you know Jesus died on the cross for you, even though you know he, he suffered, bled, and died for you to have a relationship with God, if you can just live a sinful lifestyle and it doesn't bother you, I, I, you know what? And not only do I question your salvation, I don't want you too close to me. Amen. 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 I hate sin. I hate sin in me. <coughs> Amen, somebody. It bothers me when I mess up. I recognize that. But I understand that as a Christian, God gets us to a point, hear me now, and this talks about the sensitivity of sin, that we practice or we, we commit sin less. What do you mean by that? Well, God usually starts out with the big stuff. Okay? He usually starts out with the big stuff. You quit. You quit. Uh, you quit drinking. You quit whoring. Quit. You, you know. You quit running around. You quit creeping. You quit all that stuff. Amen. He gets rid of all the big stuff, and we think we're in the right. I hear folks say all the time, oh, God saved me from, he saved me from being a whore monger. He saved me from being this, he saved me from being that. <laughs> now we move on to that lying and gossiping and judgmental spirit. Uh, uh. See, you, when you're saved, you begin to practice sin less because God begins to expose to you more areas of sinfulness in your life. He just needs to get the big stuff out of the way first. Amen? 
And once that's out the way, he begins to show you other areas of your life that need work. And I will tell you, there are people in this congregation that I see and I can tell you God is doing something in them. That's right. Amen. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind because God is now, not, now starting to work on the finer points of your life. Amen. There are people now that you, you used to couldn't be around them. Well. They're just as sweet now. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. They, they're just as sweet now. God begins to move and to work on our spirit as we begin to walk in the word and the Holy Spirit begins to minister to us. So, do you practice sin less now that you have professed faith in Christ? Are you still doing your thing? With the same frequency that you were doing it before. Amen. That's of course a question. I mean, are we just talking about are you sure you're saved? Number four. Are you basically obedient to the commands of Scripture? Amen. Now, 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 right now, I, hold on now. Stay, stay with me. Stick with me. I'll settle for basically right now. Amen. I, you know what? I'll settle for basically. If you're trying to work with the Scriptures and you're trying to be obedient to the Scriptures, the best you know how, the most some of us are going to do is basically. Amen. Because there's some folks that won't lie, they won't tithe. That's right. Yeah. Amen. There's some folks that tithe, they won't pray. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that it's a sin if we don't pray for others. That's right. Amen, somebody. Yeah. The Bible says that we should take care of those around us, especially those of the household of faith. That's right. the Bible says. It's a shame how we do our seniors now. Yeah. It's a shame. How when folks get old, we ship them off to nursing home. Because we don't want to be bothered with them. Amen, somebody. And we can sit up and talk about just how blessed we are. God bless me. God is God doing that. And you got your loved ones. Come on now. Now, I know everybody can't take care of But we've gotten too convenient in America now. We've gotten too convenient with our institutions where when folks get to a point where we don't want to be bothered with them, we just move them along. Let somebody else take care of them. Let them be somebody else's problem. Y'all didn't expect that one coming, did you? The Bible says we're to take care of widows and orphans. That's the Bible. So now you see why I said basically. Amen. Three and four really go together. You got to learn how to practice sin less to become more obedient to the Scriptures. How are you obedient to the Scriptures? When the word tells you an area of your life that needs to line up with the word, do you respond to that? Or are you grudgingly and say, I, no, I'm not going to do that yet? Just a question. <clears throat> what is your attitude toward the world and its values? James said, turn to James chapter Three, I think. Okay, turn to John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Amen. Look at verse 15. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to jump on number 5. But we're not going to get to 6 through 10 until next week. Because it's 8 minutes to 12. I want you to participate in the bake sale. And I need just a minute with this verse. Verse 15. John says, 
Do not love the world or anything that is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, please don't misunderstand what John is saying there. <clears throat> Sometimes people get to a point where they get so heavenly minded that no earthly good. I can't enjoy a good meal because it's of the world. <laughs> Amen. How many of you have ever been to Ruth Chris Steakhouse? A Ruth Chris, I'm telling you, a Ruth Chris steak will make your mouth water. They serve it on a 500 degree plate. I have them mix a little garlic with it. And then I tell them halfway through my meal, bring another 500 degree plate so that it cooks a little bit more on the plate. I'm telling you, it makes your mouth water. I can enjoy a good steak. Many of you know one of my weaknesses. I am addicted to shop. I love to shop. And I, I do. I love to shop. I just enjoy it. Now, guess what? I'm not so saved. That, that, that I look at those things and say, well, I can't shop because those things are of the world. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Buy yourself a nice car. Get yourself some nice clothes. Amen. Buy yourself some nice jewelry. It's all God's in the first place. Amen. See, it's not the world that makes those things wrong for you. It's the lust for those things that make those things bad for you. Amen. You still with me? What James said, James said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If you get a chance to eat a good steak, go eat a good steak. I mean, if you get a chance to go to a good movie, go to a good movie. There used to be a time in the church where you couldn't wear certain clothes. Amen. Because it was world. You couldn't go to certain movies. Back when I was coming up, you couldn't go to certain movies. Because it was world. Now, I do believe that most churches have gone a little too far. Some of them, the dresses are just a little too high. And the cleavage are just a little too low. Brother, I don't need to see them be able to count the coins in your pocket because your pants are so tight. <laughs> and if you come in here with them hanging down on your butt, somebody here is going to pick them up. And this is the house of God. We need to respect the house of God. But please understand, you can be fashionable and come to church. Yeah, I mean, you don't be, you spend time, you couldn't wear makeup. Amen. Couldn't wear lipstick. Amen. Put some makeup on. <laughs> Put my lipstick on. Nice outfit to wear. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. What we do, we have to do in moderation. Don't come in here looking like Jezebel. <laughs> Amen. There's a difference in looking like you're ready to go down on Woodward Avenue at one in the morning and come to church. See, y'all knew what I'm talking about. <laughs> If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For everything that is in the world, the cravings of the sinful nature, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. If you trace down through Scripture, you'll find that those are the three things that tripped up at them. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In your dealing, in your regarding whether things are things you should have or should not have, there's a test right there. Am I pursuing this because of the lust of the flesh? Am I pursuing this because of the lust of the eyes? Or am I pursuing this because of the pride of life? <clears throat> and if the answer to any of those is yes, then you need to back away from it. 
There are certain things you, you need to be able to tell yourself, I, I don't need to fool with that. Amen. Amen. And most of us know the areas in life where we still have weakness. Okay? If, if, you, if you're an AA, you shouldn't be working at a bar. <laughs> you, you, you're not going to be around somebody pouring liquor all day and not take a drink? Come on. You know your weaknesses. If you, if you're, if you're, if you used to have a pornography addiction, stay out of the club. Stay out of the club anyway. <laughs> Amen. Ain't, ain't nothing godly. You, you, you're not going to get closer to Jesus. Amen. Being in the club, and y'all know what I'm talking about. What is your attitude toward the world and its value? We need to really check ourselves on that. So you've got the first five questions of the test. How, how are you doing? So how are we doing? Amen. Amen. All right. Listen, I, I'm telling you, uh, when you when you go home, go over this and ask yourselves, are there areas in my life that need work? Because the other five is pretty rough. <laughs> Amen. But, but guess what? I mean, the word of God is pretty specific about how God wants to bless us. And remember, God is not giving us rules and regulations so that we can feel like, ah, oh, here we go, another rule and regulation. God, God just trying to punish me. No, he's trying to bless you. Yeah. He is trying to bless you to get you to be able to walk in the full. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and might have it more abundant. He wants you to have abundant life, but to do it, God and Burger King are two different things. At Burger King, you can have it your way. With God, you cannot have it your way. The Bible says, nevertheless, the foundations of God stand sure, having this seal. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. Uh, let's put our hands together and praise God for the word. And at times when, when I preach messages like this, and I'm, I'm a little careful about turning my back on my double back. Or am I throwing any back at me? But trust me. However the word hits you, it hit me all week. It only hits you from 11.15 to, to 12. It cuts me up one side and down the other. Bible says judgment begins first at the house of God. Amen. And you can't preach a word that doesn't convict you. If you do, you need to get out of the business. Listen, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, I extend the invitation for you to come. And is there one here today? If you would like to come into a precious relationship with Christ, come forward right now. If you come forward, I'll lead you in a prayer right here, right now, where Jesus can become the Lord and Savior of your life. If you're already saved, You've already received Jesus, and you're looking for a church home. I'm asking and extending an invitation for you to come. Would you come? Is there one here today? Come on, come to Jesus.
God bless you. Let's give God a praise one more time.